So, um, we talked last week about translations and talked about uh, differences in translations, need for translations. A little, little bit of a thumbnail sketch of what I would do in a college course uh, with my students. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the backgrounds of the history and the culture to where we get to the New Testament. Okay? Uh, a little bit of societal issues, political backgrounds, and what have you. You know, the, There's a period of quote-unquote silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, that say that there's an actual silence is a bit of a misnomer because there's a lot of stuff happening in that period that's pretty pivotal. Let me give, give you a little bit of background. We're going back up in the Old Testament times. You all have heard about a group called the Babylonians, right? Name one Babylonian king. Okay. Well, he was Persian, but yeah. Nebuchadnezzar. Well, that's one of the more famous ones, right? So, two important dates, and there's some debate on how to, to schedule these is, you know, according to our modern calendars, of 596 or 597, 586 or 587. But the, and often, the way I think about this, it makes sense to me, growing up as a kid, there's always the big superpowers. It's U.S. versus USSR. There's Rocky Balboa versus Ivan Draco, you know, the boxer movie, the Rocky movie. And, you know, even today you think about maybe the United States and China, the big superpowers, right? Well, back in, in the, near the end of the kingship in Israel, there were big superpowers as well. I mean, there were the Babylonians and there were the Egyptians. They were kind of the big, two big ones. And where Palestine was located, look on the map here, where Jerusalem is, this area is an important trade area connecting uh, ancient Turkey, what was formerly Hittite country, down to Egypt. A lot of trade went through that area. So it was very prized by different people groups throughout most of Israel's history. That's why you see Israel getting attacked off and becoming, putting under control of other people. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment as far as different people groups. But the Babylonians wanted it. So with their big army, they were all up in there. And they they conquered the Assyrians, which are back up in here. The Assyrians had already conquered the northern part of Israel, formerly uh, uh, Israel. Judah, the southern part, they put pressure on. During the time of King Hezekiah, they kind of laid siege to it and start collecting taxes. Well, in 586, they, or 596, they go into Jerusalem and they start uh, deporting people. The exiles. You know, you see Daniel and his buddies have been exiled and they're taken into Babylon. You see the Assyrians and the Babylonians both, whenever they conquered new land so as to destabilize the land, they would take the best and the brightest of the land and move them elsewhere. Uh, they take the leadership. They kind of cut the head off. You know, a snake with a head cut off still moves, doesn't it? It doesn't move very well. I mean, it doesn't know what it's doing. It's still it's dead, right? But if you take the leadership and you move it elsewhere and, and decentralize the power base, you, ha you can more easily control the people. So they took away some of the leadership, the best and the brightest, and moved them elsewhere to serve in the kingdom. The Assyrians did, the Babylonians did, and of course the Persians did something different. So the first kind of big exile is 596, 586. Different issues arose. They end up uh, destroying the city. The walls fell in 586 in Nebuchadnezzar. And the city was destroyed. Um, and a, a majority of the residents of Jerusalem, which Jerusalem, Judah pretty much was whittled down to Jerusalem anyway. Most of the people were deported or moved around or what have you. They set up a new capital away from Jerusalem new leadership, etc. But Judaism, the, at least the uh, Judaism we see in the uh, Old Testament after the exile is greatly influenced by this period. While in Babylon, a lot of the best and the brightest, they, they wrote down their text. A lot of the books uh, of the Old Testament weren't necessarily written down or codified. This period you find a lot of solidification of the text of the Old Testament, a lot of influence of ideas, etc., to counter the narratives of the Babylonians. Uh, for example, some argue that uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, the notion of the creation of the earth, the, the world was chaos and formless. There was a void, and God ordered that void. That, some argue that, that that narrative creation 
was shaped so as to counter the Babylonians and a lot of their religion and how the world was formed. We'll go a lot of different detail, but essentially some of those religions believe that one god uh, fought with another god and slit the god in half, and one part of the god made the sky, and that part of that killed god made the earth, and all these different narratives are counter. Maybe one of these days we'll go into that. But Anyway, so the Babylonian period was very important. The next big kid on the block were the Persians. And as Babylon, you may think of the modern-day Iraq as that area. Uh, the Persians came from modern-day Iran, that area. Okay? And Darius is one of those kings, possibly. Um, they came in, they conquered Babylonians, and one of the policies of the Persians was to allow people to go back to their land. So we find people like Nehemiah and Ezra and others going back to Jerusalem and reestablishing themselves. Uh, and setting up shop. And of course there's tensions about who's more Jewish, those who have been there, those who have been taken away, who's, who's clean, who's unclean. They reestablish the walls in 445, all this different stuff. But another superpower comes along a little bit later. You might have heard of this guy. He uh, died in 323 B.C. at age 32. A guy named Alexander the Great. <laughs> you ever heard of him? Yeah. Yeah. Alexander yeah. of Macedon. Dad was Philip of Macedon. His dad started conquering stuff, and he started conquering stuff, and most of the known world at that time was conquered by Alexander the Great. Uh, you know, as far east as modern-day India, uh, and, and, and pretty far west. I mean, in fact, uh, the, in Egypt there was a city set up called Alexandria, named after Alexander the Great. Well, he died, like I said, in 323 B.C. Uh, let's write that one there, see a reference for that. Died in 323 B.C. at age 32. His generals divided up his empire. There are 12 generals. They fought. Um, excuse me, there are four generals. Excuse me. They divide up the empire. The two most important ones that we need to talk about are the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. These two generals, Ptolemy and Seleucid. They kind of got control of the area that is around Palestine. The Ptolemies settled in Egypt, and the Seleucids settled up here in Syria. So, let me ask you this question. This is kind of a side trip if you ever on Jeopardy, you ever face Ken Jennings in Jeopardy. Was Cleopatra a native Egyptian? No. No, she was not. She was Greek. Yep. She was from the Ptolemy family. Yep. Okay. Anyway, the Ptolemaic Empire, they uh, laid hold of Palestine. It was annexed by, into Egypt by Ptolemy I in 320 B.C. For about 122 <coughs> years, the, Jews were, the Jewish people were governed by their own high priest, but ultimately they were over, had overlords in Egypt. I mean, the Ptolemaic rulers didn't really interfere with religious practices or the belief systems of the people. They kind of, I don't want to say self-autonomous, but they were pretty autonomous. They could do kind of what they wanted. As long as they paid taxes, they were good. Okay? As long as they didn't raise too much ruckus, they were good. Well, in 198 uh, B.C., one of the Seleucid rulers, uh, Antiochus III, annexed Palestine into his control. Again, remember, this is a very valuable piece of land where trade goes back and forth. If you have that land, you can regulate trade. So he annexed Palestine to serious control, and he attempted to Hellenize the people, make them more Greek. Uh, kind of a cultural uh, cultural change, if you will. Um, and that involved different things like influencing, the, making the, make sure the people spoke Greek instead of their native language. Make sure the culture was Greek, Greek architecture, Greek uh, buildings. Um, and some of the Jewish uh, elements of their lifestyle were kind of undone. Essentially, some of the religion was messed with. Uh, some of the wealthy Jews and even some of the priests, they quote-unquote, abandoned their ancient practices in favor of new sophistication. Um, they, uh, one thing was, uh, that was interesting was the uh, notion of the circumcision. Most of y'all know what circumcision is, right? I'm not going to go into detail. Do I have to go into detail? Okay, good. Uh, Ju Judaism is kind of a marker for them for their covenant with God. The males will be circumcised. Well, that was kind of a different thing for the Greeks, the Greek culture of the Seleucids, so it was banned. Um, in fact, uh, the, uh, 
there was the gymnasiums, there was uh, uh, kind of the center of the culture of the, 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 the Greek culture at that time was the gymnasiums, the gymnasiums, where people would kind of come together and hang out and do athletic events. And, and a lot of the original, well let's put it this way, the original Olympics, did they do them in uniforms? No. no. It's in the, in the buff. I can't imagine Greco-Roman wrestling with no clothes on. It'd be really <laughs> awkward. But they did it. So a lot of these <coughs> events at the, gymna the, 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 the gymnasium, the gymnasium, they were you know, done in the nude and, and steam baths and things like that. So you could tell who was Jewish and who wasn't. Mm -hmm. So if you want to fit in with the culture, with the in crowd, those in charge, you try to find a way to switch it back. You to, so uh, some Jews attempted a thing called epispasm, the reversal of circumcision, so as to fit in with the culture. Uh, eventually, Antiochus, uh, the Epiphanes, he called himself, the manifest God, the Seleucid ruler, uh, he forbade circumcision. Uh, he forbade uh, worship in the temple and sacrifice in the temple. In fact, at one point, uh, around 167, he sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. December 167 B.C. That was a big statement then. Ooh, that was big. <laughs> that was big. Uh, you know, the biggest thing for me growing up was, you know, me wearing a hat in church. That was, that was taboo. You got, I got in trouble for that. I got my butt spanked. Mm -hmm. Called down. Imagine, you know, sacrificing a pig, which was unclean to Judaism. So essentially there was this cultural switch. Um, and it's, it, part of it was control, wasn't it? If you uproot people and who they are and their identity, it's easier to control them. So more, more like if you, kind of like a brainwashing type thing, right? A little bit. Uh, maybe that's what the Russians are trying to do by hacking the election. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway, uh, there are all this tension is going on through the Seleucids are trying to make the people more pliable, more Greek. They're trying to Hellenize them. But some of the people resisted. A group called the Maccabeans. The Maccabean Revolt. This one guy, uh, Mattathias, had had enough. He was an elderly priest, had five sons, and they started conducting guerrilla warfare, hiding in the day and attacking at night. They'd pull down altars to all these different Greek gods, and they would forcibly circumcise children to make them to comply with the law of Moses. They were religious conservatives. They wanted to go back to their culture. And a year into the revolt, Mattathias died, and he charged his sons to carry on the revolt. In fact, uh, there's an intertestamental book called 1 Maccabees. It records some of the story. 1 Maccabees 2.50 says, now, my children, show zeal for the law and give your lives for the covenant of our fathers. They passed on the control of the group to his third son, Judas. They called him Maccabeus. Maccabeus means the hammer. You think he was a gentle guy? Probably not, right? So after this persistent guerrilla warfare and after the death of Antiochus, uh, Syria compromised and Judas, Maccabeus, and the rebels uh, were able to kind of wrestle control. And there was a rededication temple in December of 164 B.C., three years after the sacrifice of the pig on the altar. And this restoration, uh, alluded to in John 10.22, became uh, known as Hanukkah. Hanukkah's a uh, holiday associated with this, this situation. Well, eventually in 142 B.C., Demetrius II, king of Syria, granted the Jews complete political independence, uh, marking almost 80 years of political autonomy, uh, ending in B 63 B.C., when the Romans conquered the land. So the Jews were pretty much, from the time of the Babylonians on, the Jewish people were ruled by somebody else. From the time of Jesus all the way back to the Babylonians. They always had this mentality of being the, the captives, the inferiors, the, the held up people, the people with pressure on. Um, and the Romans didn't really help all that much. Um, the, Roman, the Roman general Pompey uh, conquered the land. But the Romans, um, they used different ways, different means of control. One mean of control was they appointed people to rule over them. So that they appointed this guy named Herod. He was an Idumean chieftain. Um, Idumea was not Judah, is not Jerusalem. Herod the Great was not Jewish. He passed himself off as being that, but he wasn't. He knew some people. In fact, he, was, he knew Octavius and Anthony, if you know Julius Caesar or Shakespeare. He uh, essentially got them to appoint him in control. 
But it took him three years to get everybody in the land under his control. He had to, kind of like David, he, he was made king, but David had to wrestle control. But Herod the Great was a brutal man. Killed two of his wives, three sons, and a brother-in-law, and his wife's grandfather. Mm. Josephus, the, uh, the Greek uh, the Jewish historian, excuse me, said it was better to be a pig in Herod's household than be one of his sons. He wouldn't touch a pig because it was unclean. But he messed with his sons, hurt his sons. Uh, in fact, Matthew 2.16 um, says that Herod the Great, after he heard about Jesus' birth, had all the children in Bethlehem, two years old or older, killed in an attempt to squelch out anybody that overthrow him. He was paranoid. He wanted, he wanted to keep control. <coughs> so his kingdom when he died was passed on his three sons Archelaus who got to southern Palestine and Judea, Samaria, and Judea Philip got to northern and northeastern Palestine Herod Antipas at Galilee and Perea uh, of course you had Archelaus Philip. now Antipas is the one that pops up more so in the New Testament Philip is mentioned, Archelaus is mentioned but Antipas, Herod Antipas is the Herod we know most about from the later part of the gospel he's the one that Jesus goes before because Jesus is from Galilee um, he's mentioned a good deal. So that's kind of the political background of where the New Testament is. The, the, the Jewish people are living under the subjugation of a family that wasn't really one of them. And they kind of were, you know, beholden to the Romans for their power and their uh, the control. Their money was tied to the Romans. Well, the Romans were, they pretty much just siphoned the money off of the land to serve their own purposes, siphoned the people and the, the money off to serve their kingdom to fill their coffers. Uh, so the people were oppressed. They wanted, they wanted a Messiah to come and to rescue them, to free them from oppression, like uh, free them from the Babylonians like they had cried when they were in exile. And God sent King Cyrus of Persia to rescue them. Uh, they wanted somebody to help them out, but Jesus was something a little different, wasn't he? Let's look at the uh, different political, religio-political groups in Palestine. Uh, and then we'll do, look briefly at the Greek uh, philosophies. So I know I'm boring y'all to death. But y'all probably know a little bit more about these groups. Y'all heard about the Pharisees, haven't you? Okay. You've heard about Sadducees, right? There's the Essenes are not mentioned in the New Testament, but they're the Dead Sea Scroll community, pretty much most scholars agree on that. There's some question about that. There's a group mentioned in the New Testament called the Herodians. They were kind of a political group more so than a religious sect. Uh, there was a group called the Zealots. One of Jesus' apostles was a zealot. And there's kind of a group that's alluded to in the New Testament, but they were 90% of the people, Jewish people living in Palestine. They're called the people of the earth. The people. Uh, the, the Hebrew term is Am Haaretz. Um, let's talk about the Pharisees a little bit. The Pharisees, and they mean separated ones. They may have some of their roots in this Maccabean revolt, that religious fervor, that conser conservative nature of going back to the way things need to be. Uh, and they emphasized on being separate and being holy. A lot of these religious rules about not eating with a Gentile person or being clean and unclean. And, you know, um, in fact, there's some uh, rules talking about walking on the same side of the street as a Gentile person. All those things were an attempt to be holy, to be separate, to be different from the world. But they had some different beliefs. See, these groups like the Sadducees and the Pharisees were kind of like Christian denominations. You know, we share a lot in common with our Presbyterian brothers who share property line with us. We share a lot in common with the Methodists and the Pentecostals. But we're, we share some differences, don't we? Or we have some differences. Um, you know, I generally don't raise my hands up and run around in church. There's some Pentecostal type churches that do that. Uh, you know, I don't believe in baptizing infants. Or sprinkling or dedicating them into the covenant, but our Methodists and our Presbyterian brothers and sisters do that. There are a few differences, right? Well, in Judaism, in the time period of Jesus, these different religious groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees had these differences. Uh, they believed in the same God, but they had little minute details that were different. One difference was the foreordination. Um, the Pharisees believed that um, God controlled everything, directed every aspect of human history and life. God was totally in control. You know, if something happened, somebody died, well, God had planned it out ahead of time. The Sadducees, they, they believed God was in control, but they denied that every aspect of life is controlled by God. There's some different things happen. A big difference was the immortality in the soul and the notion of resurrection. 
The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did. And the reason was, they had different scriptures. The Sadducees only accepted the books of Moses, the first five books as their Bible. The Pharisees accepted all of what we call modern Old Testament, plus the oral interpretation of those books as their scripture. And a lot of notion of resurrection comes from the prophets and from the intertestamental literature that they kind of looked at. Give you an example. I'm going to read some scripture here to you. And this is NIV. This is uh, Matthew chapter 22. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there are seven brothers among us. The first one married and died. And, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same, same thing happened to the second and the third. Brother right down to the seventh. Finally the woman died. Now then at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven? Since all of them were married to her. Hmm. It's a trick question. And Matthew reminds us of that saying they didn't believe in the resurrection. So they're setting him up to have him fall. Okay, because, like I said, they don't believe in the resurrection. It's not in their Bible. Jesus replied, You are in error because you know not the Scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven, but about the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read what God has said? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The reference is Exodus 3 6, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But these Sadducees were trying to trick Jesus because of their view on the resurrection. And you find different instances in there. Like in Matthew, there's the talk of the Pharisees causing brood of vipers. It says that they're whitewashed tombs. Uh, different aspects of their outlook. Now, a third difference of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees is the Pharisees believed in angels and demons. Again, that's um, something that's found outside of the Torah for the most part. For the most part, there's more discussion of these uh, uh, these entities in outside the Torah. So the Sadducees didn't believe in them. The Pharisees did. When we talk about Scripture, um, the Sadducees were numerically smaller than the Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees is a pretty popular movement. The Sadducees weren't necessarily that, but they held more political influence because they had control of the temple. And a lot of their power base rested with the Roman government. So in trying to trip Jesus up, they're trying to make score brownie points with the Romans. Okay. Now the Essenes talk about them. They're uh, more than likely the Dead Sea Scroll community. They have they were kind of the <coughs> whereas the Pharisees are trying to be holy and separate. Essenes are even beyond that. The Essenes moved out more than likely moved out into the wilderness, so up their own little commune, if you will. They had ritual bathings, they had baptism, they had their own study of Scripture, they had uh, different copies of Scripture, and had commentaries on Scripture, and instructional works, uh, devotional manuals, if you will. Uh, they had their own little cult, if you will, set up in the wilderness. Again, the Herodians were a political group, the Zealots, they hated Rome. In fact, a little subset of the Zealots were the Sakari. They carried these weird little knives, and they sometimes were known to stab Romans in the midst of crowds. And of course you had the people of the earth. They were the 90% of the people that weren't any of the previous groups. They weren't Herodians, weren't Essenes, Sadducees, Pharisees. They were always held in suspect by other groups such as the Pharisees. Pharisees could not marry just a common woman. In fact, Pharisees were not to eat with these people of the earth. The, the, the sinners, if you will. Sometimes you see that terminology, especially in Luke. Jesus ate with sinners. Well, who were the sinners? They weren't vile people. They were just average people. Now, um, a little bit of discussion. Just mention some different groups very quickly to you. Um, some of the uh, Greek philosophies and mystery religions come into play, especially with Paul's writings. But let's mention some names to you, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to Paul. But groups like the, Plat uh, the Platonism or uh, Platonism or Pla uh, Platonist. Neoplatonism especially is very influential in some ways. Epicureanism, Epicureans sought out pleasure. The Stoics, uh, they emphasized moral fiber, believed in the divine spark. Uh, the Cynics, 
They sought to free themselves of luxury and to dispose themselves to hardships and ascetic practices. Uh, there were a lot of traveling preachers who were ascetics. In fact, some may have mistook Jesus for a cynic, a traveling uh, preacher. And there are these other unofficial groups called the mystery religions, a focus on mystery. In fact, uh, you may find some people who kind of discredit Christianity talk about Mithraism. It was a Persian religion, had spheres of influence in the Roman Empire, um, but it wasn't really influential to the 3rd century, but they had this guy named Mithras. He was the sole Invectus, the unconquered son, who celebrated his birthday around December 25th. What's important about December 25th? Christmas, right? We celebrate Christmas. Okay. In Mithra, uh, uh, the place of worship of Mithra, there's an inscription that said, You have saved us by shedding the eternal blood, the blood of a bull. Uh, Mithras was said to be the mediator between mortals and gods. So there's some commonalities of Christianity, but Mithras was a different religion. Um, in fact, uh, some believe that the notion of celebrating Jesus' birthday on December 25th was kind of a counter to some of these groups like Mithraism. Because I hate to tell you, Jesus probably wasn't born on December 25th. No, I read March or Probably summer. spring or early summer. Yeah. But we celebrate it in December because at one point, the Christian church said, you know what? Our God's bigger than these other religions. You know, kind of give them a counter, something to it. Um, it's like uh, you find this big thing in, in fast food now. Hardee's has got it. and Burger King's got these veggie burgers. These impossible burgers or beyond meat. It's an alternative <laughs> to the fried patties, <coughs> but it ain't as good, trust me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they're an alternative, something to get you, kind of wean you off the other, possibly, right? Like my wife, she loves biscuits, but she's got me making these biscuits now that are just flour and, and fat-free Greek yogurt. They're not as good as biscuits by any means, regular biscuits, <laughs> but they have no fat in them. We have to put gravy on it, don't matter. <laughs> That kind of beats purpose. <laughs> but uh, it's an alternative. Anyway, so that's kind of a thumbnail background. Next week we'll look at uh, Matthew and look at the Gospels and stuff. Actually, Mark and the Gospels a little bit. But I want you all to know a little bit of the political stuff. Just realize that the New Testament wasn't written in a vacuum. There's context. Just like any one of us, we have context to our conversations. And uh, I've caught myself saying this to the boys. I, I used to hear this sometimes as a kid. This is an A, B conversation, so see your way out of it. <laughs> you know, don't butt in the middle, be nosy, get your way. Well, when we read the New Testament, we're in the middle of somebody's conversation. Because a lot of things going on in the worlds of Jesus, and then later the Gospel writers who wrote down later after the life of Jesus, that we need to think, think of. Uh, we're reading somebody else's mail when we read the New Testament. Especially Paul's letters, we're literally... Reading Paul's letters to somebody else. Reading somebody else's mail. So we need to be respectful and kind of know that there's different things that have gone on that we may not know about or different cultures we may not know about or events that may have influenced them in ways we never can comprehend. Fair enough? Okay. Questions? Comments? Peanut gallery? Anybody? Okay. Those interesting names up there. Probably the most interesting one on the board. Uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh the name of one of our church members, Paul um, Ptolemy. Oh, okay. Interesting. Ptolemy Maxwell. Interesting. Mm -hmm. How that name made it to Dallas and, uh, <laughs> over the years. Well, that's like, uh, you know, you see, uh, every now and then you see a church named Corinth. Yeah. yeah. You see a church named Corinth, and I've always wondered, why in the world would you name your church Corinth? Have you not read 1 Corinthians? Seeing how wicked and vile that church yeah, is? And the former mayor, you know, and all that. Yeah. Holy Clonic, there was a of it. I didn't realize that. Okay. Well, the, the Jewish uh, men that are uh, in the ones that wear, you yeah. know, the, the, all, yeah. whatever the city, they call yeah. that, yeah. Uh, do they not live a sort of a different lifestyle than the regular Jewish people? And what are yeah. they called? Uh, well, they the city called. Jews, for the most part, are ultra Orthodox, depends on say. Yeah. Now, modern Judaism. Is different from the Judaism we're looking at at the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it's a good bit different because of the destruction of the temple and how Judaism evolved, and that's did almost two thousand years. Mm -hmm. Modern Judaism, you have a very conservative Judaism, kind of like a city Judaism, or uh, and you have a more progressive or reformed Judaism. Uh, and it's kind of like a lot of Christians. You have some bad, or especially Baptists. You have some Baptists who are very conservative, traditionalist, King James only. 
you know, women had to wear skirts. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, men had to wear ties and suits to church. Yeah. Uh, I'd be in trouble, wouldn't I? I would too. You, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, then you have more progressive or liberal Baptists who, um, you know, it's kind of whatever. You know, and, and they don't have all these rigid beliefs. They, they may, they may even. Uh, in fact, there's uh, more two church, Baptist churches in Charlotte, pretty prominent ones, big ones, I should say that uh, are opening affirming of the LBGTQ community. Well, that's, that's a variance of Baptist. We talked about that in their Baptist study we did. And kind of like that's how modern Judaism is. There's some that are very conservative, traditionalist, Hasidic, you know, with the yarmulkes and the curly things, and they're set apart and then different in how they practice things. Uh, it's funny, I'll go, I'll go to a conference, uh, Society of Biblical Literature conferences every now and then. It had been a while. But it's interesting to see some of these more conservative uh, ascetic type Jewish people every now and then, or you'll see the guys with the white linen shirts and the vest and look like kind of dressed up, you know, and it's a little different. A little box, yeah. yeah, some, yeah, when I mean, yeah. is that biblical? Is there something in the Bible that now, in the Old lot, Testament well, that tells them to look a lot, like that? A lot of their, a lot of the modern Judaism isn't just in the Old Testament, it's also in the Jewish interpretation of Scripture. A lot of modern Judaism has a lot to do with Pharisaical Judaism, and it's kind of their great grandfathers I guess you could say. And the Pharisees accepted the interpretations, the, the oral Torah, I guess you could say, as their scripture. The the Mishnah and the Talmud, these these documents are what well this preacher says this about this. And that's kind of their modern interpretation. So a lot of their religion comes from that and a lot of these different teachings. For them, in some ways the canon is ever evolving, I guess you could say, in the sense that it what didn't just stop with the Old Testament. So some of their tradition comes from that. And you think about that, we're not too dissimilar in some ways. There's a lot of things we do in this church that ain't biblical. Mm -hmm. uh, this a wa mechanical watch is not biblical, but we use it. You know, uh, The computers and video screens, it definitely ain't biblical, but we do it. Pianos. Ted, I'm sorry, but pianos for the longest time were not allowed in Baptist churches because they were in pool halls and, and places where people were women who <laughs> you know, charged for their services. That's where pianos were. But you know, they're in churches now, right? Wrong time, right? Yeah. <laughs> mm. But uh, you know, always different. There's different cultural things that influence things. Yeah, yeah, Judaism is really different. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Okay, no. Let's be dismissed in prayer, and we shall depart in choir practice. God, we thank you for the world that uh, we're in, Lord. But help us remember that the world in which Jesus lived and walked, and the world in which the gospel writers and Paul lived, Lord, is it's a different world, different political situations, different uh, social situations, different religious situations in many ways, different outlooks on life. Help us be respectful when we look at the New Testament and remember that not everything surface level in what you may have meant by saying it in Scripture, but you still speak to us in a modern setting. You still use ancient words, words written many, many years ago to speak to us today. Thank you so much, O Lord. Now we pray. Amen.